Welcome back to Houdini Isn't Scary. This isn't exactly part four. This is more of a FAQ, Q&A kind of thing, where I answer a lot of questions that may have arisen and help you with any things that may pop up along the way that are unintended. So this is more of a clarification part rather than a part in its own. So we're going to go over a few things that may confuse you and things that I may have overlooked in the tutorials that I should have covered. So let's get straight into it. When you're working in Houdini, you're often clicking around, you know, you're doing things, you're getting things done, you're making great effects, but then sometimes bad things happen. You end up clicking on who knows what, this over here and this over there, and all of these awful things have happened and you don't know where you are anymore and it's all just a mess, right? You don't know how to get back to your scene view from here. You don't know how to get your original setup back. And the way that you can just fix this if everything looks like a mess is to go up over here where it says build. And this is what is known as a desktop. This is like a setup. So as we went over in part one, you have your scene view, your network view and your parameters. But there are other ways to set it up. That's just the default one, and that's called build. Now there are others. Uh, for example, I like to use technical. Technical is nice if you're working with attributes a lot. But if you've done something and you don't know how to get back to the way it was, what you can do is you can say reload current desktop. If you click on that, it will take a moment, but everything will come back to normal. Right? And you won't lose any progress, like if you had an object in here, it wouldn't change anything, it would just bring you back. It would just be like opening Houdini afresh. Right? So that's a great way to reset things. The other thing I want to mention are these things in between panels. So as you can see, there's this very thin bar between the scene view and everything on the right. Now what this does is it allows you to click and drag and adjust the size of windows. But if you go to the center of this bar, you'll notice that it says left mouse button click to minimize left pane. And then it'll say the same for right. So you can minimize the left pane or the right pane. If you minimize the left pane, it pushes everything to the left. So it basically removes the scene view. And you can find this new thin bar on the left hand side to restore the minimized pane. And then you can do the reverse. And once again, bring it back. And this works in all panels. And you can just do it like that. You can also switch around your panels by clicking on the middle of the bar. So now our network views at the top, parameters at the bottom, switch it again, all right? Quite useful. The other thing you can do is in a particular window, if your node setup is getting quite busy, you can press control B and this will maximize that window. So if you press control B again, it will minimize control B, control B, control B, all right? That's also useful if you want to focus on a particular panel and you want to just hide the others. You can make one of them full screen. And then another thing is we have these tabs. You know, you have your different tabs that do different things. And if you close one by mistake, so say you close your scene view, you can just create a new tab, new tab, new pane, viewers, scene view, right? And then you can drag them over and put them where you want. So just keep all of that in mind. That's just to clear up any confusion that you may have, because I remember when I started in Houdini, sometimes I would click on a random thing and I wouldn't know how to get it back to normal. And I would just close Houdini and open it again. <laughs> but really Houdini has stuff in place to help you when things like that go wrong. This is a bit more of a technical one. We're talking about vertices, points, primitives. Now in Houdini, a point, is a position in space, right? It's simply just a position in space and then you place a point at that position. So now you have a point at a position. So that point can hold all sorts of information, it can hold attributes, and that's the basis of what is known as a point attribute. We've created those before. Then if you have two points or more and you connect them, once they're connected, you end up with what is known as a primitive. So those are multiple connected points. You can connect two points to create a line primitive or three points to create a triangle or four points to create a quad. Now what that means is that multiple primitives can share points. However, that's where vertices come in. Each corner of a primitive has a vertice. So that means that vertices are unique per primitive. In a basic quad, you have four points making up one primitive with four vertices, right? And we can actually take a look at this. If we go into Houdini, we can create a grid. Type inside that grid, 
make it a one by one with only two rows and two columns, right? So it's just a single block. But what we can do here is we can also show primitives. So if we activate primitive numbers, this is primitive number zero. As you can see, if we activate points, we have four points. And then we can also display vertex markers. As you can see, there's one in each corner, right? Pretty basic, four points, one primitive, four vertices. But what happens if we increase this to three rows and three columns? Now what you'll notice is that we have three points across, three points down. That means we have three, six, nine points, but with one, two, three, four primitives. And then, as we've said before, vertices are unique per primitive. So each primitive still has four vertices. So although we have nine points and only four primitives, we have 16 vertices. So what does this mean? Well, this changes the way that attributes work. For example, if we have to add an attribute, so let's add a color and let's only add it to a particular group. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop a group node and I'm just going to duplicate it. You can duplicate by holding Alt, clicking and dragging. So I have my three groups over here. And then I'm going to do the same for the color. So holding Alt, click and drag. And then just plug a group into each one of these. So now for the first one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group by primitives. That's the default. So I can click and drag over some primitives. Enter. Then I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to set it to points. Click and drag over some points. Enter. All right. Now we have that group. We have a second group. And then the third group, we'll set this one to vertices, click and drag, press enter. Now, let's go on to our color nodes. We can select all three of them at the same time and just make all of them blue. And then the group that we want for each of them is group one in all cases. So now we can take a look at the difference. So for the first one, we need to change this to a primitive group because that's what our group is. And as you can see, it makes sure that the color does not bleed over into the other blocks. It is maintained only on each primitive. If we go over to our second one over here, where we have it running over points, you'll notice that it sort of bleeds over, right? It bleeds from the points. And then as you go across the primitive, it blends between the one value to the other points value. And finally, if we go over to vertices, we can make that last one a vertex attribute. Now you can see that it's held by only a single vertex. That vertex over there bleeds between that one, that one, and that one. So the attribute that you have on there blends across. And as you can see, this makes quite a difference. Depending on what look you're going for, you need your attributes on different parts of geometry. So take note of that. It's very easy to switch between. So you can easily change from class primitive to point, And you can also use things like an attribute promote and that can promote it from one class to another. So you plug this in and then you choose the attribute name. So we know that this is CD for color. And then you can change it from a primitive to a point or a vertex and detail. We'll get back to that at a later point. As we noted in part one, we have three axes in Houdini. We have the X axis, the Y axis and the Z axis. X axis being horizontal, Y axis being vertical, and the Z axis being your depth. And you may have heard of a compositing term known as Z depth. That refers to how far along the Z axis a particular object is. So how does this relate to working in Houdini? Well, when we create an object, for example, if we create a sphere, under the parameters, you'll notice that translate, rotation and scale all have three components to them. These three components pertain to our axes. And in this case, the order is important. We follow it as X, Y, and Z, and they relate directly to the three components you see over here. As you can see, we have this translate over here. The first one would be X. So if we move this, our sphere moves along the X axis. And if we move along the second component, that moves us along our Y axis, and we can move along our Z axis as well. And when it comes to scaling, you can scale along particular axes as well. How it works with rotation is you can almost think of it as a rotisserie. So you would put a skewer through a particular side 
and then spin it around that direction. So if you put a skewer in vertically, in other words, along the y-axis, then this would spin towards the x-axis. So as you can see, if you spin it along the y-axis, it rotates like that. And you can almost visualize the skewer down the middle as if it were a rotisserie. Same thing if we rotate around the z-axis or the x-axis. So that makes up the component. And you may notice something in the bottom left of your viewport. You can see that it has x, y, and z. And it shows it as red, green, and blue. Now if we go inside our sphere and drop down a color node, you'll notice something interesting. Our color node also has these three components. And more interestingly, they correspond to x, y, and z as well except they correspond to R, G, and B, red, green, and blue, as you can see in the bottom left. So if you make everything on here zero, except for X, you'll notice it becomes red, because when working with vectors, that's what these are called, these values that have multiple components to them, they're called vectors. When you work with a vector, the most common type has three components to it, they can be referred to as x, y, z, 0, 1, 2, or r, g, b. And in this case, it's r, red, g, green, b, blue. So if we want purple, then we want to add to b. So r, g, b, make that one, you get purple. And so you can figure out how all of this works. Of course, you don't have to know this. It just makes it easier to work with because you actually understand what each of these values are. It helps making sure that nothing is obscure. Because now we have a very clear understanding that each one of these corresponds to a different color value. So great, hope that clears up vectors. Let's go on to the next part. When you go inside a node in Houdini and you want to drop down a new node, there are multiple ways of connecting it to other objects. So if we drop down a null, the most common way is to click on this output and plug it into that input, right? Very basic. However, there are other ways. So let's say we have our sphere. So I'm placing a sphere here. I click on the output, right? So now I can plug it in somewhere, but then I press tab and type null. It will connect it automatically. Switching is very easy. If I want to switch which output is going into this input, you can click on the output, click on the input, and it'll switch them, right? So that's very basic. But you can also do things like cutting connections. So you can hold Y and it'll bring up this scissor tool and you can just click and drag and it'll cut anything that you cross. So if things are plugged in like that, you can cross, right? Pretty cool. What happens if your network is becoming a bit of a mess? So let's drop another null, connect this to all of these and just move these, you know, in some weird way. What you can do is you can press L and what L does is it lays it out. So it lays it out in a neat way for you. And the other thing that you could do is if they are all a mess like this, you can select a couple of nodes. So say you only want to select the nulls, hold shift, click on a null, click on the next one, click on the next one. And then you can do something like shift A, which will align them all horizontally if you click and move to the right. And then you can distribute them evenly by holding Alt and A. And you end up with that nice little setup. Another cool thing you can do is you can add what's known as a dot in a connector. So if you alt and click on a connector, it'll add this dot. And this dot acts almost like a midpoint that you can split from. Right, so that's just a way of neatening things up. And the cool thing about the dot is if you want to replace the input, it almost acts like a null in its own. So another thing that you may want to do is if this box is too small and you have a large node setup and you're very busy with nodes and you don't really need to see the scene view or anything, you could press Control and B in this box over here to make it full screen. So we can work like this. Let's drop down a switch. Now, if you have a switch, you'll notice that they aren't separate inputs. There's just this one bar. And this means that you can connect multiple things in, you know, you can connect as many of these as you want. But 
The thing that I want to show you is how we control which input is which. So I'm just going to press Y, click and drag, cut all of those. Now, let's say I plug my box in and then I plug my sphere in. As you can see, it considers the box as the first input and the sphere as the second input. So you can switch between which input is coming through. If we take a look at our viewport, we can switch back and forth between these two and you end up with a dotted connector versus a solid connector. The solid one is showing which is currently being viewed. So, you know, very easy to swap back and forth, but what happens if we want our box to be our second input? Well, what we can do is we can rearrange them in here. We can press up and it'll switch them around, right? So just a neat little trick and you can do this with a merge node as well. If you have a whole bunch of things merged in and your orders are mixed up, you can switch them around over here. So this is just a neatness thing, basically. Because you're working with nodes a lot of the time, you want everything to remain neat. And you know, there are other things that you can play around with, such as network boxes. If, for example, all of these nulls aren't important to see, you can put them in a network box, right? Move them around as one unit and also minimize them. And then of course, give this a name of its own. So you can call it something like null box. And this just neatens things up and makes it a lot easier. And you have other tools. You can press C, that'll bring up your colors. You can give different things different colors by clicking on them and then clicking on a color. So doing it this way, you can color coordinate various things and it just makes working in Houdini a little bit easier. And if you have a node halfway between a connector, a cool way to disconnect it is to actually just wiggle it around. If you wiggle it, it comes loose. So that's a pretty cool thing that I haven't seen in other software. You know, you have something plugged in, wiggle it, comes loose, and you can slide it in somewhere else. And so that's all very useful, just to make your life a bit easier when you're working with nodes, so your node setups don't become a complete mess. I hope that this helped to clear up some of the confusions that you may have had with Houdini. You know, a lot of the small things that kind of pop up when you don't expect them, the kind of things that get in your way and you spend an hour trying to find on Google. Honestly, it just ends up wasting a lot of your time. So this is really just for convenience. We'll be back with part four soon. I do hope you enjoyed this. If you did enjoy this, please leave a like, consider subscribing. We are releasing these tutorials a lot more often than we used to. And this seems to be the direction that this channel is going to take. So thank you for supporting us. Thank you for supporting us on YouTube and on Patreon. So if you want any more content, you can go over to our Patreon and check it out over there. And a special thanks to all of our patrons who make this possible. They make it free for everyone else. And so, you know, a huge thank you to them. And here they are. Here's the credits. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.